The castles of Wales have seen many bombardments and sieges over the centuries. This is the story of one long siege and the simple but terrifying weapon that brought it to an end. The building of the magnificent Raglan Castle began in the 1400s and its architecture was intended to show that it was a luxurious home as well as a very strong fortification. Building work was started by Sir William Ap Thomas, remembered as the Blue Knight of Gwent, apparently because of the colour of his armour. Work continued under his son, who anglicised his name to William Herbert, and who became the Earl of Pembroke. During the civil wars of the mid-1600s, much of Wales initially supported King Charles, or at least the gentry did. Raglan became a royalist stronghold, but after a few years of war, Parliament was gaining the upper hand. Colonel Thomas Morgan was appointed commander of Parliament's forces in Gloucestershire, Herefordshire and Monmouthshire. His job was to capture those castles that still held out for the king. In 1645, he took Chepstow and Monmouth castles and then set his sights on Raglan but it was going to be a very tough task. A lot of preparation work had been done to defend the castle. It was surrounded by a deep moat. The garrison had been increased to 800 men. It had a good store of supplies and there was even a gunpowder mill inside to supply its cannon and muskets. Many of the local well-to-do royalist sympathizers fled to the castle for refuge from the Roundheads. Raglan was owned by the elderly Marquis of Worcester. As a staunch loyalist, he wasn't inclined to give up easily. Also, he was one of those royalist leaders who were unlikely to be pardoned by Parliament. Colonel Morgan came and placed his force around the castle. On June 3rd, 1646, he demanded that it be surrendered. The Marquis said he would not do so without the King's consent. Parliament's top engineer was uh, at the siege. He was Colonel John Hooper and he immediately set about building trenches to protect Parliament's troops from gunfire from the castle and also constructed platforms for cannon to pound the castle walls. And when the bombardment started, it was incessant. Cannonballs of around 20 pounds, just over 8 kilograms, smashed against the walls. Although they damaged the upper ramparts, they just bounced off the more sturdy lower walls, doing little more than chipping the stonework. Morgan's guns, some of which would have looked like these, just weren't powerful enough to breach the castle's masonry. At the end of June, Colonel Morgan told the Marquis that the King had consented for several important garrisons in England to surrender, which was true, but seems to have been doubted. It's quite possible that the King had simply forgotten to mention Raglan. Morgan also warned that Sir Thomas Fairfax himself, the head of the new model army, was on his way with a substantial force. Still, the 84-year-old Marquis declined to yield. The bombardment of the castle continued and Parliament's musketeers tried to pick off defenders on the ramparts. But the muskets of the time were notoriously inaccurate weapons, although they could be very deadly if you had the misfortune to be hit by a musket ball. And one evening, there was a very unusual incident. The Marquis was giving an after-dinner talk to some of his guests when, suddenly, a musket was fired by a roundhead outside the castle. The musket ball smashed through an ornate stained glass window. It ricocheted off a marble pillar and, having spent its lethal force, struck the Marquis on the side of his head as he spoke. The lead musket ball thudded harmlessly onto the dining table. An eyewitness said that some of the ladies present at the dinner fainted with shock, 
But the Marquis made the best of the moment with a small joke. He told his guests that this incident proved that his head was musket proof. After five weeks of siege, the garrison tried a mass breakout. Hundreds tried to overwhelm Morgan's men, but they didn't succeed. They were beaten back. In August, Sir Thomas Fairfax finally arrived at Raglan, aiming for a speedy and bloodless end to the siege. He offered the Marquis a last chance to surrender on favourable terms. In a polite and friendly exchange of letters, the Marquis said he would not be forced out of what he called his own house. But then a new weapon arrived and it was to change everything. And this was it, Roaring Meg. It isn't much to look at, just a stubby four feet of metal with a very wide muzzle. It isn't a cannon, it's a mortar, designed to lob large objects over high walls, and it fired not a solid iron cannonball, but a huge bomb or grenade made of softer metal and filled with gunpowder and assorted debris. A fuse was lit and the bomb was fired. Upon landing it exploded, sending shrapnel in all directions, it was designed not to batter down walls, but to kill, injure, and cause fear. A mortar bomb may explode immediately, or, depending on the setting of the fuse and the expertise of a gunner, could delay some seconds before blasting all around it. The people inside the castle knew all about mortars and the terrible things that they could do, and from what they could see was being prepared outside, they knew that what was coming would be terrifying. Captain Hooper, the engineer, now began building war platforms for Roaring Meg and other smaller mortars and cannon that had arrived with her. Roaring Meg was fairly new and had quickly ended a siege at nearby Goodrich Castle. Fairfax wrote to the Marquis warning him of what was about to happen. He told him about the death and ruin that had been inflicted at the fall of Royalist Basing House in Hampshire. He promised that the Marquis would be treated fairly. A truce was agreed in mid-August, and on the 19th the garrison was allowed to march out of the castle with honour, with drums beating and flags flying. They had to give up their arms and disperse. The Marquis, although arrested, reportedly was in good spirits, and he even asked Fairfax to look after two pigeons he had been feeding. And so the siege of Raglan Castle was over. It had lasted nearly three months, longer than most sieges during these civil wars. And then Parliament had complete control of Wales and the marches. At Raglan, the appearance of Roaring Meg had tipped the scales. And so Fairfax gained the bloodless end to the siege that he had sought. The warlike Colonel Morgan, however, may have been disappointed that his hard work had not resulted in a more dramatic finale. The old Marquis was taken to London under arrest, and there he died within a few months. As was commonplace at the end of Civil War sieges, the order was given for Raglan Castle to be slighted, that is, damaged so much that it could not be used as a fortification again. It was duly largely destroyed and its fine contents looted and dispersed. And so Roaring Meg had done its job without firing a single mortar bomb. It still exists and can be seen today at Goodrich Castle in Herefordshire. <laughs>